not. There I am. Okay, good morning. Welcome to Fourth and Mill worship time. Find a seat and we're going to worship God together. You know, I've really, really enjoyed this series that Pastor Cliff's been preaching on 1 John. You can know, you know, know what you know, what you know. And the first song we're going to sing this morning kind of celebrates that. We are who he says we are. And that settles it. We can know that. So would you stand and join us? Who you say I am. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be, it will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. 
so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. Jesus is coming again. We have that to look forward to. In fact, we have so many reasons. Praise God. We have about 10,000 reasons to bless the Lord.
changes for the better. I pray, Lord, that the words that are spoken this morning and again the things that are sung are the things that are from you. We thank you and praise you for all these things and your wonderful mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. morning. Hey, all right. It is good to see you this morning. Um, This is my favorite part of the week, every week. Uh, I'm just, I'm so glad that you guys are here with us this morning. Thanks for being here. I don't know um, I don't know what ended up getting you here other than God, but I'm glad he brought you here with us this morning. If you are new or visiting with us, my name is Doug Betts. I'm the children and youth pastor here, and so I just want to welcome you. Um, one of the best ways for somebody who's new or, or wanting to find out more about our church is, is to check out the bulletin. Um, lots of information about who we are and, and things that are going on in our church can be found there. Um, also, I would like to remind you at the end of each row, there is a friendship pad. Um, if you would pick that up and, and pass that along if you or maybe someone down the road uh, Might uh, wish to be contacted by a pastor. Maybe you have questions about uh, membership or baptism or whatever Maybe you can mark that in those friendship pads and, and we would uh, Get a hold of you then and then of course at the end of each service pastor Dave and pastor Cliff and myself will be at the doors And if we haven't met we'd love to meet you uh, visit with you 
And, and of course, as always, if you have anything that you would like to pray about, we would love to pray with you as well. Um, just a few announcements I have. You may probably saw the uh, Operation Christmas Child table, which is set up out there. We're in full swing with that. Uh, a, a reminder, and again, this information is in the bulletin, a week from today, next Sunday, from 2 o'clock to 3.30, a young lady named uh, Dania Yadago will be speaking um, on behalf of Operation Christmas Child. She actually was a recipient of a box years ago and has a, a really a pretty incredible story to tell about how that, what kind of a difference that box made in her life. And so, again, that's next Sunday here at the Family Life Center gym. That starts at 2 o'clock. Um, and then Wednesday, a uh, big day for children and youth ministry. If you have a, uh, a student, uh, first grade through sixth grade, our children's ministry clash has started. We're in week three, and that takes place from 6 o'clock to 7 o'clock in the Family Life Center gym. We get it kicked off. We're uh, doing a, a series. We're, we're looking at video games. Yes, I know, parents. I'm sorry. Um, but, but, but we're twisting it um, in a way that they can examine things they learn. Uh, through video games and take a look at, at how that can relate to God and other things. For example, uh, this week we're, we're looking at multiplayer games because God did not intend any of us to be alone in, in this game, in this life. And so we'll talk about that this week at Clash uh, for our children's ministry. And then our high school and junior high student ministry fusion is uh, this Wednesday from 7 to 9. We're going through a series on haves and have-nots. Uh, instead of looking at a lot of things that we wish we had but we don't have, we're looking at things that, that God has given us, the things that we do have, and how we can use those um, to redeem, to glorify Him, um, whatever it may be. And last week, I uh, just want to share real quickly, uh, we talked about last week was haves that we have today. We, we had talked about our past, we have our past, and we have today. And uh, Grant Ingram shared his testimony um, on Wednesday night, and man, it was so good. And, and I'm just so... I texted him afterwards. I'm just, I don't know if proud is the right word, but just I'm, I'm excited for what God is doing in his life and to see it come out in his story for his obedience and willingness to stand up and share uh, some things that were probably really difficult for him to share. Um, it was just really good. And God worked through that. Um, a, a student, a seventh grade girl, later gave her life to Christ that night that God was working to grant. Yes. <laughs> Now, you don't, I don't think we realize, like a lot of us think, oh, I have a story in this, whatever, but man, your story matters to people. Um, if it doesn't matter to you, I promise it matters to somebody. So anyway, uh, we're, we're doing our, our have, we have a future, and we're going to talk about that this Wednesday at, uh, at Fusion for our 7th grade through 12th grade students, um, so I'm excited about that. Uh, I saw Joni. Joni, did you have something you wanted to say? Thank you. It was, it was a lot of fun. I didn't run. I was there, but I didn't run. Um, Blake really tried to get me to run. He was pretty convincing, but I, he, maybe next year, maybe next year. Um, but it was. Really appreciate the support, and it was cool. There were a lot of people out there. Um, and then finally, at this time in our service, we're going to do uh, Kids Church, which is for uh, kids kindergarten through fourth grade. We're going to go up into our fusion room. Um, we're continuing the, the lesson that we've been uh, we've been going through the book of Genesis, and today uh, we're going to talk about a time when God changed Jacob's name, gave him a new name. So we're going to talk about that up in the fusion room. <clears throat> in the Old Testament times, the Jewish people had to go through a priest to access God. The book of Hebrews explains many of the limitations of that system and how God has provided a better way. We need to consider this concept in God's word and how it relates to our prayers on this important topic. I invite you to listen as I read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, which says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach 
God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What can we learn from these words from Hebrews chapter 4? In this passage, the writer of the book of Hebrews speaks of grace two different times. First, with the invitation to let us approach God's throne of grace. And secondly, so that we can receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of our need. One writer has stated about this, that grace is God's tumbling, rumbling reservoir of strength and protection that never runs dry. We need to be reminded of God's grace as we pray together as a church family today. For our prayer time, we will uh, have the things that we shared in our earlier worship service as joys and concerns. And we also have some cards that have been turned in and items have been passed on verbally to the pastoral staff to include during our prayer time. But we want to welcome the things that you would share right now, not only joys and concerns, but especially testimonies about what God is doing in and through your life. Whatever's on your heart, we want to pray together as a church family as we share those things. What would you share as a prayer of joy, concern, or testimony? Yes. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies. We welcome the things that are on your heart. Yes, Vernon. You bet. Well, it's good to see you. We're glad that you're able to be here, and we take her one day at a time, don't we? You bet. Thank you for sharing that. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies, we welcome the things that are on your heart. I see you pointing. There you go. Yeah. That's great. We'll pray for that, that God continues to provide direction and, like you say, volunteers to help. Super. Thank you for sharing that. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies, we welcome. Yes, right there. Thanks for sharing that, and we'll continue to pray for us. We, t we take her one day at a time, and some days it's more clear than others, but like you say, God's at work. Thank you. Other joys, concerns, and testimonies? Yes.
<laughs> Thanks for sharing that. That's neat. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. That's great. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. <coughs> I'm going to lead us in. Oh, I see a hand back there. What's that? Eric Flatter, right. Eric Flatter family. I know you mentioned that you lived close to them in the past, and we'll remember that family in our prayer time. Sorry to hear that. We'll pray for her. I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a minute with a pattern of prayer that's different than we have had recently. This is a pattern of prayer taught by Mark Licato in his study, Before Amen, in which he identifies four simple types or parts of prayer. The parts are, first, Father, you are good. Secondly, I need your help. Third, so do they. Others need your help. And fourth, thank you in Jesus' name. I want to encourage you to pray on your own. I'll offer some suggestions as we're praying, and uh, you can pray on your own however God prompts you. Father, you are good. As we are beginning our prayer time, I ask that you would pray on your own, uh, praising God in your own heart however he prompts you. We worship you, Lord. We worship you as a creator, sustainer, and giver of life. Blessed be God. You're amazing. You're God alone. What a wonderful creator. No wonder we worship you. No wonder we praise you. Praise God. Praise God. I need help. As we continue in our prayers, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart about your own life, however he prompts you. Philippians 4 reminds us that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We need that. I need that. Forgive us when we have looked to compare ourselves with others instead of you, God. If we could save ourselves, there would be no need for Jesus to come. We need the same peace and forgiveness that only you can offer. 
we can't do anything in our own power to take away our guilt and to save ourselves when we realize we don't deserve your forgiveness. We can't earn it. We can't pay it back. It's only by grace. Therefore, I confess my sins and I repent and I humbly ask for your forgiveness, peace, healing, and cleansing. They need help. As we continue on in our prayers, I invite you to pray in your own heart, praying for others however he prompts you. Lord, we do pray for others that your touch would meet them at their point of need. Some need your touch physically, others emotionally. Some need it relationally and some need it spiritually. But you are the one that can make a difference in the lives of people. Lord, we pray along with Linda Smith for her mom who's in the hospital with a broken pelvis. We pray that you would heal her, touch her, protect her from complications. Help her, we pray. We pray for Maddie as she's shared that she's been through some rough times and it's been dark sometimes, but she knows that you're at work. We pray that you would continue to work in and through her situation and show yourself strong on her behalf. We pray for Rachel and thank you that Blaine Jr. and his wife have made it to relocation and a new responsibility as, where he works as a worship pastor, but the church is growing and they're praying for wisdom now for folks to help and and the insight on how to use the gifts and abilities of volunteers to make a difference, we pray that you would be with them in all that concerns them. We uh, give you praise, and we uh, uh, want to uh, uh, ask for help for John Urie as he has uh, pneumonia. He's been on a trip and came back and is uh, in need of your touch, your healing. We pray that you would be with uh, him and all that concerns him. We pray along with Laura Hagee for... Uh, her daughter's family, Grace's family, as four out of the five or six with a variety of illnesses. Touch them and help them, we pray. Be with them in a special pray way, we pray. We pray along with Beaver Yuri for a niece in Missouri who's battling cancer. Help her and be with her as she uh, struggles with this uh, uh, challenging health concern. We pray along with Janice Stauffer for Stacy Town as she continues to battle cancer. It's been a challenge and it's uh, the most difficult it's been now. So help her, we pray. We also pray with Janice for her daughter Brenda for medical concerns to be with her. We pray along with Don Robinette for his daughter Carla. We're glad that she's uh, at home from the hospital, but we pray that you continue to heal and re uh, restore her, help her to recover, be with her. We pray for John Redman as he waits for surgery in December for painful bone spurs in his foot. Help him, we pray. Uh, protect him and keep him, we pray. We want to pray for the families of those who have experienced passing of loved ones. We pray for the family of Bobby Hines as her memorial service was last Monday. Send comfort and peace, we pray. As uh, Phyllis reminded us, we want to remember the family of Eric Platter, whose memorial service was earlier this week. Send special comfort and peace to that family in a difficult time. Pray for the family of Harold Seeley's son, Clarence Seeley, whose memorial service will be tomorrow. Send comfort and peace. And for the family of Mark Gormley, who passed away yesterday. For each of these families, send your comfort and peace and be with us to prompt us to be your hands, your feet, your voice to reach out and share and encourage and inspire those who uh, have experienced loss. We pray for Pastor Cliff as he preaches today. Fill him, anoint him, use him, allow him to be a channel of your truth. And may your spirit be present to prompt the hearts of each one who hears that we may sense your direction on how we can take whatever the next step is for each of us on our spiritual journey. Thank you, Lord. As we continue on in our prayers, I invite you to talk to God in your own heart, thanking him for whatever he prompts you for. give you praise God for the opportunity to share in this church family and to be involved and to encourage one another on our spiritual journey we thank you for each one because each is valuable and important and significant we give you praise along with uh, Christy Vetter that this church is alive that there are lives that are growing up and learning about Jesus and there's people that are responding in faith in a variety of ways and we thank you for that Thank you for Vernon Adams' testimony of the appreciation that he shared for the cards and support and, uh, and 
ways that he has been lifted up through some of the challenges he's experienced. We pray you continue to be with him, to show yourself strong on his behalf. We pray along with Tammy and give you thanks for the Youth Sonic Car Hop program and for the funds that they raised for the Operation Christmas Child. We also thank you for Tristan's uh, birthday coming up this week and uh, Tammy's memories of how uh, he was a little one at one time and now he's almost 18. We uh, uh, thank you for Aubrey's uh, testimony about uh, how a 101-year-old lady uh, sharing her life and even reciting the Lord's Prayer was having a powerful influence of sharing faith with a young nurse, and we just uh, commit that uh, whole opportunity to you and thank you for it. We thank you along with Gene Nyberg for the way that you worked in uh, uh, Terry's life when he had a spill off of a ladder in Topeka last weekend, and uh, he was gently brought down to the ground without uh, serious injury, uh, no broken bones and only sore. We thank you that the guardian angels were uh, there to be helpful and protective for him. We give you thanks along with Phyllis Shelberg for uh, great times that she shared with her sister as she's been here to visit. And we pray for safety as Phyllis will take her back this next week to Manhattan to fly back east to her home. We give you thanks along with Doug Betts for Grant Ingram's testimony and the great time they've had in sharing at the Fusion program. We give you thanks along with George Stroop for the testimony that he's just glad to be here. We give you praise uh, for Bethany Recky joining the church family last Sunday and dedicating her two boys, Keegan and Tyler, and we pray that you continue to be with her to help her as she influences them on their journey. We give you praise for Tristan and Ashley Long as they dedicated their baby Aubrey uh, at the service last Sunday also. Be with them, we pray. We give you praise for the heart choices Walk, Run for Life that Joni spoke of and for the funds that were raised and inspiration and encouragement continue to be with them. We give you praise for Operation Christmas Child Shoebox Program Speaker next Sunday afternoon. We pray that that would be an inspiration to many. We just lift all these things before your throne and uh, we pray in Jesus' precious name as we trust you for all these joys and concerns. glad that you all are here this morning. It's uh, just a privilege to hear you share the blessings in your lives and the challenges that you're experiencing and just the opportunity that we can pray together about those things. So I appreciate that. We're going to uh, share the Lord's Supper here in a moment. The deacons are going to pass the trays containing the juice and the bread. And uh, we would certainly invite everybody who has yielded your life to Jesus to share in this uh, meal with us. We would just ask that you hold the elements until all are served and we will take them as a family. You know, I, as I take stock of our congregation and look around, I'm just blown away by the number of uh, gifts and talents that are possessed by each and every one of you and how you share them uh, so willingly with our church body. Uh, this month, I've been especially mindful of the praise teams and how they really help prepare our hearts uh, for worship each and every Sunday. And as I looked at the list of the, the songs today, you know, I, I just thought, how can I add anything to the words that we've already sung about what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So I just want to share one verse from uh, one of the songs that we, we sang, Glorious Day, and just how it resonates with me on, on what Christ did for us on the cross. It says, Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, whoa, what a day. I think the Apostle Paul had similar thoughts in mind after Jesus called out his name on the road to Damascus. In Galatians 5.1 he wrote, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened by a yoke of slavery. And then in 2 Corinthians 5.17 he wrote, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is only by your grace that we stand here before you today. We just thank you that you have made us free in you. You have taken our sins to the cross, and you buried them in hell, and you rose again, that we have hope and victory over death. Lord, we look forward to your return again to take us home to heaven one day. 
We just thank you for your Holy Spirit that you've blessed us with to guide us and protect us and encourage us as we still battle here on this earth. We just give thanks in your name, Lord. Amen. is recorded in the 22nd chapter of Luke. It says, And he took bread, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Take and eat. And then in the same way, he took a cup. And he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Take and drink.
And now as we consider our offering, I would like to dovetail a little bit off of one of the songs we also sung earlier, 10,000 Reasons. The number 10,000 occurs a few times in the Bible, with, with one of those in the 18th, 18th chapter of Matthew, where Jesus tells the parable of the unforgiving debtor. There was a servant who was brought before a king, and the servant owed a great debt to the king. It was recorded that it was 10,000 talents, which today equates to millions and millions of dollars. There was no way the servant could pay the debt off, so he begged the king for mercy. The king took pity on the servant and canceled his debt, and he, he declared him free. So what did that forgiven servant do? He went right out and found a fellow servant who owed him a few bucks and demanded he pay his debt right now. No grace, no generosity from him. As we consider and give in our offering, may we be in tune with the Holy Spirit given to us by our risen King. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you now recognizing that uh, you are the giver of all good things. You are so, so good. And we don't give back in any way to try to earn grace. Your grace is free and given to us unmerited. So what we give isn't to, to earn our, our spot in your kingdom. But Lord, I think it, uh, we can reflect our heart, our joy that we find in you with our attitude and giving. So Lord, I just pray that as we grow in our grace and understanding of your love for us, that our hearts would just abound in giving and of our talents and offerings of treasure and, and uh, all those things you've given us, that we would just do it joyfully and with open hands. I just ask it in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. Yeah, it is great to have you here today. Um, and we're really, really glad we do have a very alive congregation uh, this morning. I, my ears are not always reliable, but it sure sounded like you were meaning what you were singing uh, earlier. It was great. Uh, um, I try to keep up with you. I sing above my pay grade sometimes, and then uh, I lose some of my voice. But it's really great to hear... Uh, a body of people singing praise to the Lord from your heart. So thank you for worshiping with us today. Um, we pray that you will uh, um, also be blessed as we look into God's Word together. So if you have a Bible, um, you can help us today finish off this uh, book that we've been looking at, a letter we call First John. Um, today we're going to finish off the, this series that we've been working through by looking at First John 5, the fifth chapter, verses 13 to 21, which takes us through the end of this book. So next week we will start um, a new sermon series and we're going to start a series on prayer um, that I feel like the Lord has prompted me to, to have us look at for the uh, several weeks. But uh, today we're going to look at um, John giving kind of a summary of what he's looked at. And I know he's repeated a lot of themes as we've gone through this book, uh, but this is uh, a really good summary that also brings another new angle uh, to some issues that John has been looking at. So 
Uh, follow in your own Bible or on the screen here, but listen as I read from John, John, 1 John 5, 13 and 21, and remembering always um, the Holy Spirit's here, the Holy Spirit loves you, the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you, and so let's listen for God to speak to us as we hear his word. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. If you see a brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who, has bo who was born of God keeps them safe, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one, we know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols which sounds like a very random way to end the, the reading. But uh, I think that John has something that we'll look at here to tie that last verse in as well. But let me pray first, and then uh, we'll look into God's word. <clears throat> we give thanks, Lord, and we just pause to ask for this great help that we need, that you would open our minds and our hearts so that we could really hear you, uh, that we would know the truth, that you would take any confusion that we have as we read your word and remove it. Help us to be clear uh, about who you are, who you say we are, and the truth that you want us to live in. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this feels kind of like a million years ago, but um, there used to be a time I was excited to go to our mailbox and see if we had mail. You know, I hardly get any mail anymore with email and everything's electronic and all that stuff. But you'd go to the mailbox, did we get any mail? And, and I, I remember, like clockwork, there was a piece of mail that you'd get kind of once a year. I don't even know if this still exists, but um, remember Publishers Clearinghouse? Anybody remember that? You'd get this big card in the mail, and it was exciting because it was good news. We'd get this card, and there, and it's personalized. It was personalized. <laughs> Clifford, Hagee, you have won $25 million. That's what it said. Big, bold print. Like, honey, grab the kids. We're going out to eat tonight. That's for sure. $25 million. But of course, there was always this little asterisk that was at the end of that line, and then it would, it would kind of point you down to fine print. And at the fine print, then it said, Clifford, you, you have won $25 million if your card is the prize-winning card, which is another way to say you have not won $25 million, right? So there's good news, and then there's the fine print that steals all the joy of the good news. And I'm using this as our starting illustration because John is telling us good news. Gospel means good news. And John says, here's the good news. There is a God who loves sinners, he is holy, we're not, but he loves sinners and he has done everything necessary to save us and rescue us. This is good news. You can live in his kingdom now. You can enter his kingdom because of all that he has done through his son, Jesus Christ. This is really good news. We preach it and proclaim it here. We seek to do that every week here. But as people hear that good news, I think a lot of them think, yeah, but the fine print is where I lose the joy of that good news. Well, what's the fine print for a lot of people with the gospel? You are saved if you can now measure up. You have a new life 
if you can now avoid sin. You are a child of God if you can be a good enough Christian. And that's the way a lot of people receive the good news. It's sort of like, yeah, it's, it's good, but it is undercut by this reality that once I actually start trying to live in God's kingdom as a child of God, I, I fall short. I sin. And when that sin becomes a reality, when I'm aware of it, it feels like, yeah, but I can't, I can't really experience the joy because I still mess up. And this, really, this whole letter is John's, in one of the greatest themes, John is trying to address that very fact. Too many people say, I believe the good news, but the fine print has robbed you of a sense of security, that you really are saved, that you are in him, and a sense of joy, that you can live in that, despite the fact that there is still these struggles that we have. John puts it, I love how he summarizes, he, verse 13 is his summary here. Why'd you write this, John? I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life, that you are not undercut by some sense of fine print that robs you of that joy, that you would know, and that this knowing would actually have this confidence that you could approach God with a real confidence and not this sense of dread or fear but a real confidence in coming to the one who has saved you. Well, the only way that this happens is that the love of God overcomes these fears. This is what the love of God is always doing. The reason we preach the love of God is not to say, well, that's all that matters that you know God's love, but that it it actually deals with these issues. God's love is always casting out fear in our life. If you really know his love, it casts out fear. If you really know his love, it begins to root out anxiety. His love begins to remove worry from our lives. And and in this one area especially, that God would say, I want to remove the fear that you are, well, I'm I'm sort of a Christian, but now I had a bad week and maybe I'm not even a believer. Maybe I've lost my salvation. But God wants to address that fear. And how can he do that? Well, he's going to have to, he's going to have to deal with it by helping us understand sin. And here's how John puts it. And it's a very I think a lot of people are confused by this passage because they see these two phrases, verse 16 and verse 17. John talks about sin in two very different ways. And it's like, what in the world is he talking about when he says, there is a sin that leads to death. And then just a verse later, there is a sin that does not lead to death. So he takes sin and he's going to break it into these two very big categories, sin that leads to death and sin that does not lead to death. And how do we understand that? And the first thing, just really quickly, is to say, clearly John is not when he says there's a sin that leads to death, and when there's a sin that doesn't lead to death, death is not just a reference to physical death, because everybody is going to physically die. Our bodies are going to die. And so John is saying, of course, that's a result of the curse of sin that's in our world, that our bodies will die, but I'm not really talking about physical death because everybody is going to experience that. But what he is saying is this is really about what we would call eternal spiritual death. When the Bible talks about hell, it's really talking about this eternal death of the soul. And John's saying there's sin that leads to this eternal death, and there is a sin. You can sin in such a way, but it doesn't lead to this eternal death. What's the difference here? Let me give you two ways that some interpret this that I I think is incorrect, but is prevalent. And the first way is some people take this and say, well, John is saying that there is a particular really bad sin that if you commit it, it leads to eternal death. You're lost. If you commit this sin, if, even if you had salvation, you're going to lose it because this particular sin must be so bad that you lose your salvation. And then some people try to define what that is. Like, gosh, well, well tell me what that is. I sure don't want to commit that sin. And then people begin to say, well, it's probably something really bad. Some people say it would be murder. Well, that must be the sin that leads to eternal death. Some people say, well, maybe adultery or suicide or stealing or lying. Or I've heard some people say, no, it's taking God's name in vain. You do that, it's, you, lose your, you lose your salvation. If you're Baptist, it's possibly if you start dancing. 
you know, that you might lose your salvation. So, I'm sorry if you're Baptist. We love you. We do. We do. But I've heard so many people begin to try to pinpoint a really particular sin. Maybe that's what John's saying. If you know what the really bad sin is and avoid it, then you won't be in danger of losing your salvation. Others would say it's not one particular sin, but it's a whole category of really bad sins. And then you'll hear names kind of attached to this. These are deadly sins. These are mortal sins. You commit these sins and you will lose your salvation. And the goal here is they say, you understand what the difference between mortal sins and then they make a the separate category of what they would call venial sins. Or they're sins, but they're lesser sins. You might commit those sins, but you don't lose your salvation if you commit those. But a mortal sin, you lose it. They would say, if you sin any of these big sins, and they, they will type to name them, like murder or adultery or grand theft or really big, bad sins, that if you look at those sins and if you had full knowledge that it was a sin, and you had full intent to commit that sin, and you had full freedom, you weren't coerced to do it, if all those three are in place and you've committed one of these big mortal sins, that what it does is it destroys the grace of God in you and you are at that moment that you commit the sin, you're lost. Now they, they would say, well, maybe confess, come back to Christ, but in that moment, they would say, you lose your salvation. And I want to argue this morning that I don't think that's at all what John is saying here, and I don't think that's what Scripture teaches. And I'm going to go through a bunch of Scripture references here, not to overwhelm you. I put these, most of these are going to be listed in your bulletin under your message notes so that you can go back and look at them later. I encourage you to do that. So I'm going to kind of blaze through some of these. But I want to give you four reasons, biblically, why I don't think John is saying that there's a sin that leads to death and it's a particular kind of sin and avoid that. I think what he's saying is something different and here's why. Four reasons. The first one, and I'm going to start with, we always say context matters in your Bible, right? Read what's around you. So I'm going to start with the immediate context of 1 John and then I'm going to expand it out to the fuller context of Scripture. But I think all of these support this truth first reason it's not a particular sin that you would lose your salvation by is it undercuts what John says just one verse later in verse 18. What does he say? The one who was born of God keeps them safe. That's a reference to Christ. That Christ keeps us safe and the evil one cannot harm them. This is what John says. Just in verse 18, one verse later, after talking about the sin that leads to death, there's a sin that leads to death, a sin that doesn't lead to death, but you have this one, Jesus Christ, who keeps us safe. And if it's true, if it's true that you can receive the grace of God, and I'm saved by grace, but after that it's up to you, after that it's up to me to keep that salvation, then Jesus, that verse can't be true. Jesus has no way to protect you or me in our salvation if it all depends on you. Jesus can root for you. You say, Whoa, I hope you avoid that mortal sin. I hope you avoid that sin, but it's out of my hands. It's really up to you. There's no way that Jesus can actually keep you safe in the security of the salvation he gives you if, in fact, it all depends on you avoiding some major mortal sin afterwards. So that's my first reason. The second reason is this. And by the way, it's... it's let me just add to that first reason. Jesus says in, in the Gospel of John, let me pull this out, just not First John, but the Gospel of John. Jesus says these words that are very powerful about how he protects us. I give them eternal life. And then it's up to them. They might lose it, they might not lose No, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. And later in John 17 and 18, Jesus says, none has been lost. I have not lost one of those you gave me, speaking to his father. And he's saying, when you are in me, there is a sense of security that you should know that you have because I am the one who protects you in that salvation. I don't just give it to you, I protect you in it. Second reason, it would destroy the truth of our identity as a child of God. What John stressed in this letter back in 1 John 3, 1, what does he say? See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. That is what we are. We just sang it. We are children of God. But if it's true 
that God says, I make you a child, but you can lose your childness. You can lose your being a son or daughter by what you do. You're not really a child of God. You would be an employee because you can lose your job, right? You do something really egregious at work. You, you, you mess up some rule that they have and they say, we're sorry, but we got to let you go. You're gone. You might be a slave. You lose favor with the master at any time and the master can say, I'm sorry, but you're done. You're no longer mine. But a child, can you imagine a parent saying to a child, you are ours. We rejoice at the day that you were born. We remember you. We embarrass you in church when we remember your birthday because we say, hey, you know, we're so glad that, but that's exactly what we're saying. You are a joy to us and you belong to us. Can you imagine a parent saying, you are my child forever and always? Unless, of course, you do this, 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 or this. And at that moment, you are no longer our child. You are dead to us. Now, I know that actually happens in our world. But every time it happens, there's something deep in us that says, that is not the way that a parent really loves a child. The love of a parent to a child says, no matter what you do, you are always my son or my daughter. It would undercut the very truth that John has said back in 1 John 3, 1. The third reason, it establishes a form of what we call works righteousness that says your salvation, which we all say, no, you're saved by grace, but is not sustained by grace, it's sustained by your works. So at this point, it becomes works righteousness where you begin by grace, but then everything else of that is your effort. And whether you keep your salvation or not depends entirely on how well you do. And John, not, not just John, but other, and we'll go to Paul here, he addresses this very specific issue when he writes to the churches in Galatia. The believers in Galatia were having this problem. Oh, we're saved by the grace of God, not by my works, but by what God has done for me. I received that. And then they thought, but now we better keep all the commandments perfectly. We better keep God's law perfectly. And they were taking the grace of God, but then saying, now the rest depends on us, and we'll go to the commandments, and we'll try to make that a standard that if we keep it well enough, we'll keep our salvation. And here's what Paul says in Galatians 3. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit, grace? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Do you see what he's saying? This is not you are saved by grace and now it's all works. You are saved and sustained by grace. You can't live unless you have grace. And God says, and I provide it. I continue to pour it out to you. That's the third reason. Here's the fourth reason. Maybe this is the most clear. Once someone begins to say, John is saying there's a hierarchy of sins. There's mortal sins and there's venial sins, and the mortal sins are worse. Those are the ones that cause you to lose your salvation. I think it goes directly against Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. So when you go to Matthew chapter 5, which is a big bulk of that message that Jesus gave, you read this. You have heard that it was said, this is Jesus speaking, you've heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. So here's a mortal sin. If I sin, I'm going to be subject to judgment. If I do this, I'm subject to hell. And Jesus says, no, you've misunderstood. Here's why. But I tell you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Do you see what Jesus does there? He's like, it would be really easy for us to start to make our categories of sin. These are the really bad ones. Do those, you might lose your salvation. These are sins, but not so bad. Because Jesus knows this. As soon as I start making categories for sin, just take a wild guess which category you think I'm in. Because when I make my categories, I'm pretty sure whatever the really bad ones are, I'm not doing and I'm saying, I'm probably, you know, hey, I'm a sinner, but I'm a sinner on this level. I'm sure not doing the really bad ones. And Jesus says, this is really, really dangerous to think of sin this way because he says, at the very root, it's the same sin. It's the same sin. He said, the anger and the contempt that you get for somebody who really makes you mad. Oh, man. Jesus is saying, do you realize at the very root, it's the exact same sin as murder? Oh, come on, that's just overblowing it, Jesus. That's crazy. 
Jesus said, no, that's the nature of sin. Same sin. Now, don't for a second think Jesus is just crazy because it can't possibly be as bad to think ill of someone in my heart. I'm mad at them. I'm contemptuous as to actually murder them. Jesus is not at all trying to say that there's no difference between the immediate consequences of the sin. Of course it's worse to murder someone than to be angry in your heart in the immediate sense. Of course it is. And Jesus is by no means saying, hey, as long as you're mad in your heart, you might as well get your money's worth out of this sin and go ahead and murder him, right? I mean, he's not saying that. He's trying to say, don't make these hierarchies. Because as soon as you do that, as soon as you do that, not only are you losing the joy of your salvation, you are losing all of the peace and security because now you're saying, in the biggest sense, it all depends on me. My security depends on me. And Jesus says, I did not make you to live in that kind of fear because you will be in fear. You will live in constant fear that you have gone too far, messed up too badly. What is John saying? If it's not a hierarchy of sins, if it's not a specific sin, what is he trying to say? There's a sin that leads to death. I think he's saying at the root, at the very core of our sin. So let me refresh this thing for us. We've often said this, we're all sinners, right? Your pastor is a sinner. You're a sinner. We're all messed up sinners. We still sin. But what we say is we're sinners not just because we do some specific wrong actions. Those are sins. If I'm angry or contemptuous in my heart, that's a sin. But that's not what makes me a sinner. Do you know what makes me a sinner? That I actually have within me a sinful nature that pumps out sins. It's the source of sin. And guess what? We're all born with a sinful nature because of the fall. Because of Adam and Eve's fall, sin is introduced, and now every one of us is born not innocent. We are born with a sinful nature that does this. It's not just a specific action. It's actually the approach that we take to God, which is to say, I don't trust God. I don't want to surrender my life, give my life to God. I don't want to obey God because I don't trust God. I don't think God wants the very best for me. I think the only way for me to get the very best life is for me to be independent from God and choose my own way and choose my own path and act as if I can live independently even though I am a created being, fully dependent on the Creator. And in that moment, our hearts are always in enmity, the Bible would say, against God. We are suspicious. We don't want to surrender. We don't want to obey. And that is the source of every sinful action we will do. And I think so what John is actually saying is I'm not talking about a specific sin. What I'm saying is there is a sin that leads to death that's at the very core of who you and I are. And if that sinful nature is the overarching driving force of your life, it will always lead to to eternal death, always. This is where we have to understand the difference between wanting to be forgiven and wanting to get off the hook. I've said this before too in this series. This is so crucial though. To be forgiven means that you want to restore a relationship. Forgiveness is a relational term. If I say, please forgive me, I did something wrong to you, what I'm really saying is, I want relationship back with you. I want you to forgive me so that we can be together again as friends, as as people who don't have anything between us. If you're asking for forgiveness, it is a relational term, and you're always saying, I want the forgiver. If you want off the hook, what you're saying is, I just want to get away with not having the consequences of my actions come back on me. Parents do this all the time, all the time. Parents, they've got two kids. They've got an older sister, a younger son. The younger son wants something that the older sister has. He figures the best way to get it because she won't give it to him. Whack her on the head. Boom. Whacks her on the head. There's this little bit of a mini war that takes place in the living room. Mom or dad hear it. They come rushing in. What's going on? What happened? And then the stories begin, right? Well, he hit me on the head. Well, she had this thing that I wanted. She didn't give it to me. Well, the whole problem started when he was born. You know, if he wouldn't be born, we wouldn't have this mess. And they're going back and forth. And so the parent is just trying to just want some peace here. 
So they start to sort this out. They're like, okay, if I want you to tell your sister that you're sorry. Tell your sister that you're sorry. Yeah, but she, if you don't tell your sister that you're sorry, you are grounded until you're 27 years old. And I don't know how I'll pull it off, but you are grounded until then. Because I go, I'm sorry. And immediately, mom says, well, I gotta make this, I gotta make this even. So your brother said he's sorry. Tell him you forgive him. Yeah, but he, I will ground you till you're 27. If I forgive you. Does anybody in their right mind really believe that real reconciliation and forgiveness has taken place in that moment? No. And I'm not saying don't do that, parents, because if you really want to get a nap on Sunday afternoon, you got to do those sorts of things, right? You got to kind of clear the air and just, just be okay with one another. But in that moment, you realize when you say, forgive me, he doesn't want the forgiver. All he wants is, I just don't want him to get grounded until I'm 27. He doesn't want the consequences. That is the big difference between getting off the hook and being forgiven. So when we say the gospel, the good news is this, God has made it possible for you to be forgiven. And we say, well, of course I want, who wouldn't want to be forgiven? So many people are actually just saying, I'm so glad I get off the hook. Because in that moment, you have to ask yourself this. When Jesus says, I will forgive you all sins. I will forgive you everything. That in that moment, he's saying, do you want me? Or do you just want to get off the hook? This is why I think John is actually referencing what Jesus taught. This is in Mark chapter 3. In Mark 3, Jesus said this. Truly I tell you, People can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. Can I just pause there and say, if you're here today, and if you're saying, yeah, I know Jesus forgives, but there's, and I know there's a lot of things he, he's forgiving, but there's, there's a couple things that are too bad. Like I've gone too far. I've done it too many times. Don't you hear Jesus saying, all sins can be forgiven there's nothing that he cannot forgive. There is no magical, unforgivable sin. I committed the one unforgivable sin, and that forgiveness can never reach that. Jesus says, all sins can be forgiven. And then he says, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. What is he He just said everything could be forgiven. He's saying, yeah, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is not some other specific kind of sin. It's saying, to say to the Holy Spirit, I want forgiveness, but I don't want you. I want to be forgiven, God, but I don't want you messing with my life. God, I want forgiveness. I just don't want Jesus walking with me every single day, telling me how I should live. And to, I want the, you're saying, I want off the hook. And Jesus is saying, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is actually at the very core of forgiveness, saying, I want forgiveness, but not the forgiver. And you can't, it does, it's not possible. It's not possible. It's not that God doesn't want to forgive you. You're basically saying, here's the truth. You cannot be forgiven if you will not be forgiven. You cannot have reconciliation with God if you don't want God. And God's there saying, I have it for you. I love you. Please, let's come together and be reconciled through my son, Jesus Christ. Well, I just went off the hook. That can't be forgiven if you don't want the forgiver. That is what John is saying. That's the sin that leads to eternal death to say I just went off the hook that can't be forgiven because God's saying the only forgiveness that happens is through me if you don't want me I can't help you and at this point John is saying so that's the unforgivable sin in the sense not one particular thing but this heart that says I just don't want God but here's the truth here's the, the glory of this the good news. But John says, but there is a sin that you commit. Sins. All kinds of different sins that you can commit that won't lead to eternal death. You can actually be living and saying, I, I, I blew it again. I messed up again. And it will not lead to eternal death. You can be sinning and not lead to eternal death. How is that possible, John? Well, it's not that you stop sinning. So when John says in verse 17, Here's where repentance is going to be our sign for eternal life. 
When John says all wrongdoing is sin, there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. A lot of people begin to say, well, that means I have to stop sinning. But that can't possibly be what John means because remember the beginning of the whole letter? What does he say in 1 John 1? If we claim to be without sin, if we claim that we have stopped sinning, that I'm no longer continuing in sin in the sense that I don't sin at all, he said we deceive ourselves and the truth's not in us. So he doesn't mean that continue, we don't continue to sin means that you've stopped sinning altogether. It means that there's a continuation of sin that somehow is broken in the life of somebody who keeps sinning. Does that make any sense yet? Well, look at this. John's saying there's a break. There's, there's not something that just happens without something else going on. And here's what it is. Here's another verse for you. Paul wrote, and this is a verse that a lot of people will quote sometimes about, the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 says, Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And a lot of people read that to say, yeah, you know, God doesn't like it when you sin. And it's sort of that line, you remember that old line, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy? You ever heard that one? Maybe that happens in your house. It's a little condescending to moms, but here's the deal. Most of people think, yeah, if God ain't happy, ain't nobody going to be happy. So if the Holy Spirit is grunt, you don't want a grumpy Holy Spirit living in you, right? So that's why you don't grieve the Holy Spirit, because God would be very unhappy with you. No, the reason he says don't grieve the Holy Spirit, and he says it if you read the rest of the verse, what does it say? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed, with whom you are now one. The reason God says don't grieve the Holy Spirit is because he's saying because it will grieve you. Do you understand that you have the heart of God? And when the heart of God feels grief and pain for the sin that you commit, so do you when you're in Christ. And John is saying when that dynamic is happening, that means no sin just continues. No sin just happens in your life without grief. And let me put it the other way. Grief means you feel conviction. Like, oh, I did it again. That very sign of your heart. I messed up again. This is the sin that I have done a million times and I did it again this week. That that very grief is the grief of the Holy Spirit within you. And when John is saying you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, you're secure because you have the Holy Spirit in you, it's this joyful thing that says, do you realize that the sin didn't just continue unabated, unchecked, because in that moment, even though you might do it again this week, you're going to feel grief because God feels the grief within you. You grieve the Holy Spirit, you're going to grieve yourself. And that is actually a sign that you are secure in Christ's love. You are secure in your salvation because the Holy Spirit is grieving within you and you are too. That's why I feel bad when you guys are, some of you come and you're like, oh, you're just so distraught. I, Cliff, this sin, though, I have done so many times. I'm like, if you didn't care about this sin, if you blew this sin off as, hey, nobody else around the world really cares about this one. This is just kind of more of a Christian thing, and the world isn't really concerned about it. The culture isn't worried. In fact, the culture may even celebrate that sin, but you are grieved by it. I'm, I feel for you, but I'm saying, man, that's, that's a sign you're in Christ. The Holy Spirit is grieving, and so are you. It's meant to actually be a, a help to us. Here's the danger. If you don't feel that, or if you plan on, see, this is the whole difference between being wanting to be forgiven or off the hook. A lot of people say stuff like this, and it scares me. They say, look, I know this whole gospel thing, but Cliff, I want to live my life. And later on, when I settle down, and by the way, does that ever happen? Does anybody ever settle down at any stage in life? It doesn't happen. If you're the, later on, my life gets settled out. Then I'll get serious about God. Hey, I know I can commit this sin because you keep telling me God will forgive anything. So after I commit this sin, I'm planning on it, but I know that God will forgive me if I just ask him. Here is the, it's the oh, scary danger to me. You have no idea that after you commit the sin that you will want to be forgiven. You say, well, of course I would. No, you'll want to get off the hook. But you have no idea 
that if you have sensitivity to God right now, but you say, but I'm going to blow right through that because I want to do my own thing. I want to commit this sin, and God will have to forgive me afterwards because that's who he is. You have no way of guaranteeing that your heart will want forgiveness, want the forgiver after you do it. And here's my biblical example for that. You would be in real danger of being an Esau. If you remember Esau from the Old Testament, you remember that Esau was the one who had a birthright, and he came in one day, he was starving, he's just really, really hungry, and he's got a bowl of soup that he basically says, look, I'll trade my birthright for this bowl of soup right now, because I'm just really hungry. I want what I want now. He sells his birthright. Birthright, by the way, is blessing. Birthright is everything. If we used our words, it would be birthright is salvation. And here's Esau saying, yeah, salvation sounds great. Heaven sounds awesome. But you know what? Right now I want what I want. I want this bowl of soup. And he trades his birthright. And later on, when he wants it back, there's really interesting verses in Hebrews 12. Read two verses here. Don't be unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal, for you know that afterward... When he desired to inherit the blessing, when he wanted the consequence, you know, I I want the consequence removed. I want the blessing. He was rejected. Why? He could not find repentance. We all assume, I can ask to be forgiven at any time. You may not want to be forgiven. If you understand forgiveness means wanting the forgiver. You may not want God. And it says, he sought it with tears, Don't get your mind in in this picture that, oh, he's crying out to God and God is just saying, no, too bad, you blew it. No, no, no. He couldn't find repentance. He didn't want God. I want all the blessings God might give me, but I don't want God. He could not find the desire to want God. If you feel even a flicker, I mean a mustard seed of desire for God, act on it now. Now, don't wait. You wait, you have no guarantee that you'll even want God later. It happens. And God is saying, oh, I don't want that to happen to you. Don't be like that. I'm here now. Here, let me close with this example. Maybe this will help. Tom Yoder is a guy who works for a Peace Corps. And he was working with, over in Africa, with a tribe. And over in this tribe that he's working with, he's trying to help them farm better. Their farming techniques were, were not, very, um, not very efficient, not very good. And he's trying to teach them how to farm better, how to market their products better, just really basic stuff that would help them as individuals, families, communities, if they would just receive from him some of this help. But he found it very difficult because he's an outsider coming into this African tribe, and they didn't trust him. He's an outsider. He's not one of us. We're not going to listen to what he says. He's really struggling with that, and he, de- he describes this happening one day. A little boy came to Tom, and he pointed to the far end of the village, and he said, you see that hut down there at the end of the village? There's a family that lives there, and everyone in the family has fallen ill. They've been abandoned to die by the rest of the tribe. But the children are my friends. Can you help Tom? And Tom says, let me help. And he rushed Immediately, without even stopping to think, he just rushed over to the hut. He entered it, and he immediately realized that the family altogether had yellow fever. And for the next six days, Tom Yoder, he bathed them. He fed them. He nursed the family back to a, a kind of a level of health where they could then take the family and transport them 90 miles to the nearest hospital. And they stayed at the hospital for a time. And with all that care, they were able to be, they recovered. They came back to the village completely healthy and whole. He said, then the transformation happened. Now suddenly, he said, everybody's really receptive to what I say and what I do. He said, they even gave me a new name, the great fearless one. He said, because I just went right into that hut that was full of sickness and disease and helped them out. They call me the great fearless one. But in his journal, he wrote, But actually, he said, it's easy to be fearless when you've been vaccinated against a disease. That's the truth here. It's easy to be fearless if you know that you've been vaccinated against a disease. You can walk right in. And I'll tell you this, you don't understand how vaccinations work, right? 
You understand that, you know, they create these antibodies in your body, and it does not mean, I guarantee you that Tom Yoder's body had the virus of yellow fever in his body. It wasn't like immunization keeps you from ever getting it. Present in his body is the virus of yellow fever. But what has happened because of being immunized, vaccinated, his body is able to not only have that present, but now to fight it. It never, it never continues in him to death. Do you see the truth of the gospel here is this. You've been immunized from sin by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in you doesn't mean that you don't have any sin in you. It means that the sin doesn't continue unchecked to bring you to death. What it means is always the Holy Spirit is sending out antibodies and it recognizes this as sin and it begins to cover it and and surround it and say, we've got to deal with this. We're going to kill this off. When your life is filled with sin and you're saying, I can't possibly be a Christian, but you're feeling the grief, you're feeling conviction, you repent, you want the forgiver. You say, I want him, but what about this sin that's present in me? Don't you realize you've been immunized? Don't you really, you've been vaccinated by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is the one who says, yeah, this sin again for the millionth and one time, here it is again, but I recognize it, I grieve it, I'm convicted. The Holy Spirit is the source of your security. Now, can you imagine a people that could go out into a world that's sin sick and not be afraid and say, yes, I still sin, I have sin in me, but it does not continue because the Holy Spirit continues to identify it and kill it. And you can have this too. A people that would be fearless going out into the world. That's exactly what God wants. He does not want you living in fear. And whatever sin that you're wrestling with right now, you feel that grief, that's a sign that God says, oh, you are secure in my love. You are a child of God. Don't doubt it for a second. But if you're here today and you have had desire for God, but you're like, "Eh, I think I'll put that off. I I know this sin in my life, but I'll ask for forgiveness later. Don't wait. Do not hesitate. Now is the day. The feeling that you have that desire for God, don't let it go away. God is here, and he wants you to know the security of being in him. Let's pray. Father, you know our hearts. You see things that no one else sees. That would be a terrifying thought if we didn't understand that you are a God who loves us and is seeking to save those who are lost. Not to crush us, but to save us. I I pray right now, God, for those who are in Christ, who know Jesus and have received his, his spirit that lives within them, that they would know the joy and freedom of not having fear being able to live as a child of God fully and completely because that joy, God, is going to be contagious and it's going to make an impact in this world. Help us to live that way. But for those who have not really received, maybe, God, they have thought about forgiveness as just getting off the hook. But I pray right now, if they have any little seed that desires you, would you take that seed of faith and grow it right now so that they respond to you? Because, God, that would be a celebration that someone has come to know you and be in this very moment, in this very place, a child of God. God, make that happen only by your spirit, not by us, but by you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So listen for God right now. Listen for the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is prompting you with joy that's bubbling up because you're like, I am, I'm secure in him, then sing it. This is a great song uh, to worship God with. If you feel God moving you and you want to pray about anything, it doesn't matter what it's about, just come on out. We make this a safe place for you to visit with us. Just come on out while everybody else is singing. We'll pray with you out there uh, by the doors. We'd love to do that. Let's stand. Let's worship God today. You stood before creation.